In this video, we'll cover the key steps and structures involved in how the kidney maintains homeostasis. We'll start with an overview of the kidney's role, then explore the nephron, the structural and functional unit responsible for filtration and reabsorption. Along the way, you'll see just how efficient the kidneys are. Humans have two kidneys and filter around 180 litres of blood each day, which is roughly the equivalent of filling a bathtub 15 times. Yet nearly all of that fluid is carefully reabsorbed and balanced. We'll look at the process of ultrafiltration, where small molecules are filtered from the blood, followed by the proximal convoluted tubule, where useful substances are reabsorbed. Then we'll examine the loop of Henle and how it creates a concentration gradient to conserve water. From there, we'll move on to the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts, where the final adjustments to the filtrate are made. We'll also discuss how the hormone ADH regulates water reabsorption. And finally, how the body redirects blood flow to different organs during sleep, rest, and exercise. Let's begin by thinking about how the body keeps its internal conditions stable. This is called homeostasis. One of the most important organs in maintaining homeostasis is the kidney. The kidneys perform two closely related functions osmoregulation. This means regulating the amount of water and solutes in the blood to keep the internal environment balanced, and excretion, which is the removal of waste products such as urea, which is formed from the breakdown of amino acids. Maintaining the correct osmotic concentration in the blood is crucial. If it is too high or too low, cells may become dehydrated or swell, which disrupts normal cellular function. Osmotic concentration is measured in osmoles per litre. Let's now explore how different parts of the kidney contribute to these processes. To understand how the kidney carries out osmoregulation and excretion, we need to look more closely at the nephron, the microscopic functional unit of the kidney. Each kidney contains about a million nephrons, and each nephron performs the essential steps of filtration, the selection and movement of substances from the blood to the nephron, and reabsorption, the selective movement of substances from the nephron to the bloodstream, and excretion. We will explore these processes later on in the video. Filtration begins when the blood enters the nephron through a network of capillaries. As blood passes through the capillary bed, called the glomerulus, Small molecules like water, salts, glucose, and urea are filtered out. These useful substances, such as glucose, most water, and some ions, are reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. What's left behind, which is mainly waste products and excess substances, is excreted from the nephron and eventually becomes urine. This basic pattern, filter, secrete, reabsorb, excrete, forms the foundation for all the specific structures we'll cover next. Surrounding the nephron tubules is a network of tiny blood vessels called the peritubular capillaries. After blood passes through the glomerulus, the blood continues to flow and enters these capillaries, which closely follow the shape of the nephron. Including the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and collecting duct. The close proximity of these capillaries to the tubule system allows for a high surface area for exchange. Structurally, this arrangement is essential for allowing the nephron to adjust the composition of the blood through processes like reabsorption and secretion. You can see in the diagram how these capillaries wrap tightly around the tubule system. This design ensures that blood can interact with nearly every section of the nephron. The nephron structure is very complex with all the twists of the tubules, glomerulus, and loop of Henle, so removing the capillary network allows for the diagrams to focus on the processes in the nephron, rather than the blood flow and what happens after filtration. Moving forward, the video will focus on the structure and function of the nephron. Let's focus in on the first region of the nephron, where filtration begins. Blood enters this region through a small artery called the afferent arteriole, which leads into a tangle of capillaries called the glomerulus. This arteriole is wider than the vessel that drains the glomerulus, known as the efferent arteriole. 
This difference in diameter creates high hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus, essentially forcing water and small molecules out of the blood and into the surrounding Bowman's capsule. This pressure-based process is known as ultrafiltration. Only small molecules like water, glucose, amino acids, sodium ions, and urea are able to pass through. Larger molecules, such as plasma proteins and blood cells, are too big to filter and stay in the bloodstream. But not everything passes freely. The inner lining of the Bowman's capsule contains specialized cells called podocytes. These cells have finger-like extensions that leave small gaps between them. These gaps help to form parts of the filtration barrier. The fluid that collects in the Bauman's capsule is now called the filtrate. From here, the filtrate flows into the proximal convoluted tubule, which is where selective reabsorption takes place. Useful substances like glucose, amino acids, and much of the filtered water and sodium ion are reabsorbed back into the bloodstream through the surrounding paratubular capillaries. These are the same capillaries that continue on after the glomerulus. What remains in the tubule includes toxins, excess ions, and urea, which will continue through the nephron to eventually become urine. This entire section is responsible for filtering the blood and reclaiming what the body needs, while beginning the process of eliminating waste. Let's take a closer look at the filtration barrier, the structure that ensures only certain substances pass from the blood into the nephron. This barrier lies between the capillary lumen of the glomerulus and the Bauman's capsule and is made up of three main layers. The first layer, fenestrated endothelium of the capillaries. These are the thin inner linings of the glomerular capillary they contain tiny pores or fenestrations that allow water and small solute to pass through but prevent blood cells from escaping the capillary. Basement membrane. This is a gel-like protein-rich middle layer that acts as a selective molecular filter. It blocks larger molecules, especially plasma proteins, and repels negatively charged substances due to its own negative charge. It is crucial in maintaining what stays in the blood and what enters the filtrate. Podocyte. These are specialized epithelial cells that line the Bauman's capsule. They have long extensions called foot processes, which wrap around the capillaries and leave narrow filtration slit. These slits are bridged by a slit diaphragm, a fine protein mesh that adds another level of filtering. Together, these three layers form a highly selective barrier. They allow water, ions, glucose, and small waste molecules like urea to pass, while preventing larger and essential components, like albumin and red blood cell, from being lost. Understanding this barrier helps explain why kidney damage can lead to protein or blood in the urine, because when these layers are compromised, they lose their selectivity. Let's now follow the filtrate into the next part of the nephron, the proximal tubule, where reabsorption begins. Once ultrafiltration has occurred in the Bauman's capsule, the resulting filtrate, which includes water, glucose, amino acids, sodium ions, and urea, enters the next part of the nephron, the proximal convoluted tubule, or PCT. The proximal convoluted tubule is a long coiled segment of the nephron located in the cortex. Its main job is selective reabsorption, the process of reclaiming valuable substances from the filtrate and returning them to the bloodstream. The cells lining the PCT are highly specialized. They have microvilli, tiny projections of the cell membrane, which form a brush border and massively increase the surface area for absorption. These cells are also packed with mitochondria, supplying energy for active transports. What gets reabsorbed in the PCT? 100% of glucose and amino acids are reabsorbed in a healthy person. About 65-70% to of sodium ions and water are also reabsorbed here. Other ions like chloride ions, bicarbonate ions and some urea are partially reabsorbed too. 
Water follows solutes by osmosis, meaning as sodium is pumped out of the tubule, water comes with it. This helps maintain proper blood volume and pressure. Secretion also occurs here. Some waste products, drugs, and hydrogen ions are actively secreted from the blood into the tubule, helping to regulate blood pH and remove toxins. By the time filtrate leaves the proximal convoluted tubule, it has been significantly reduced in volume, and much of the body's essential materials have been recovered. What's left moves on to the loop of Henle, where water conservation begins in earnest. The loop of Henle plays a central role in the kidney's ability to conserve water and produce concentrated urine, especially when the body needs to retain fluid. This is especially important for the organisms that live in extremely dry environments, such as the kangaroo rat or the camel. The loop of Henle has two main parts, the descending limb and the ascending limb. The descending limb is highly permeable to water, but impermeable to ions like sodium and chloride. This segment lacks active transport mechanisms and utilizes passive diffusion. As filtrate travels down into the medulla, Water is drawn out of the tubule by osmosis into the surrounding medullary tissue, which has a high solute concentration. This causes the filtrate inside the tubule to become increasingly concentrated as it descends. The ascending limb is impermeable to water, meaning water cannot leave. As filtrate enters the thin portion, solutes such as sodium and chloride move passively to medullary interstitial fluid. In the thick portion of the ascending limb, sodium and chloride ions are actively pumped out of the tubule into the medullary interstitial fluid. These actions create and maintain a high osmolarity in the medulla, shown by the particles here, which is critical for pulling water out of the collecting duct later on especially when the hormone ADH is present. Filtrate flows in opposite directions in the descending and ascending limb, shown by the blue arrow. This arrangement amplifies the medullary concentration gradient, allowing the kidney to reclaim water later in the nephron, especially under conditions of low hydration. By the time filtrate exits the loop, it is more dilute but the medulla has become very salty, meaning hyperosmotic, setting up the conditions needed for the collecting duct to reabsorb water and concentrate the urine if the body needs to conserve fluid. After the loop of Henle, the filtrate enters the distal tubule, also called the distal convoluted tubule, or DCT. This section plays a key role in the fine-tuning of iron and pH balance. The DCT is involved in the regulated absorption of sodium and calcium ions and the secretion of potassium and hydrogen ions, helping to maintain electrolyte balance and blood pH. It increases sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion, especially when blood pressure or sodium levels are low. From the distal tubule, the filtrate flows into the collecting duct where the final volume and concentration of urine is determined, largely based on the body's hydration status. This is where hormonal control becomes critical. Osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus monitor the osmolarity of the blood. If the blood becomes too concentrated, for example due to dehydration, the posterior pituitary gland releases antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. ADH acts on the cells of the collecting duct, signaling them to insert aquaporins, special water channel proteins, into their membrane. This increases the duct's permeability to water, allowing more water to be reabsorbed into the bloodstream and producing concentrated urine. On the other hand, if the blood is too dilute, ADH secretion decreases. Fewer aquaporins are present, less water is reabsorbed, and more water remains in the filtrate, leading to the production of dilute urine. Together, the distal tubule and collecting duct allow the nephron to respond precisely to the body's moment-to-moment -moment need, balancing salt, pH, and water to maintain homeostasis.
While hormones like ADH help regulate how much water is reabsorbed in the nephron, another key aspect of homeostasis involves how the blood redirects blood flow to different organs based on its current needs. These pie charts show how the body adjusts blood flow to different organs depending on its current activity. During sleep, the body prioritizes restoration and internal function. Blood flow is directed towards the brain, kidneys, and digestive organs to support processes like memory consolidation, detoxification, and nutrient absorption. The kidneys continue to filter blood during sleep. The brain maintains a steady supply for processing and regulation of sleep cycles. Muscle blood flow decreases since there's little activity and the overall demand for oxygen is reduced. When at rest and awake, blood flow is more balanced with substantial portions still going to the kidneys and gut, while the brain and muscles get moderate flow to maintain alertness and posture. During exercise, the body shifts the blood flow dramatically. Muscles receive most of the blood to meet high oxygen and energy demand. As a result, blood flow to the kidneys and digestive system is reduced as these functions are temporarily deprioritized. These shifts are part of the body's way of maintaining homeostasis, making sure each system gets the blood it needs based on activity level. Together, these processes, from nephron function to hormonal control and shifting blood flow, work continuously to keep the body in balance. We've now explored how the kidney and nephron work together with hormonal signals and blood flow adjustment to maintain internal balance. A summary of the content covered in this video is given here. Pause the video and read through the statements to reinforce the main ideas.